Hello everyone, my name is Noé Mandel, Director of Scottish Documentary Institute. And once again today we meet up for a masterclass and this time we're really very, very lucky to be able to bring Varda Barkar all the way from Santa Monica <laughs> to talk to us about a latest film, Fandango on the wall, at the wall, sorry. And um, Varda is basically a, a director, but also a writer, and uh, uh, she's got a, a very interesting background. Uh, she may be based in Santa Monica, but as we we're just saying, she was born in London from a, a, a Romanian dad, a South African mom. Uh, that makes a hell of a kind of heritage for you to carry around. And of course, you have to become a storyteller. So, Varda, really, really thank you very much for, for coming along and talking to us about uh, your film. So maybe uh, tell us a little bit about how you come to become um, a documentary filmmaker. How did you get into it? Mm. Well, Nori, thank you so much for the kind introduction, and I really appreciate this opportunity to share and provide whatever I can, you know, hopefully will be helpful to someone. So I really, really appreciate this. Thank you. You're very welcome. <laughs> uh, well, how it came into documentary filmmaking is kind of an interesting story. I had really visioned myself as being a scripted director and had written a number, you know, maybe like six scripted films and, uh, you know, worked as a script supervisor on like at least five feature films and as an AD and production manager and so forth. And sort of landed being a script supervisor on commercials while I was raising my children. And right at that time, I was also volunteering in hospice. I was volunteering with veterans who were dying. And that was an extraordinary experience, which I did for seven years. And during that time, I met a veteran in his 30s named Shane, who was dying of a, of a really tough uh, disease. He had these uh, tumors that were going down his spine that they could not operate on, even though they were benign. And they would lodge in different places in his spine, slowly diminishing his ability to do anything. So he just was slowly declining. And um, he had been a medic in the military, but he also was a great artist. He did a lot of, he was really into doing like um, sort of superhero cartoons and things like that. And he'd won awards. He, he brought, he had his mother bring them to the hospital so I could see them. And he'd always had this dream of making films. So I thought, oh my God, like we can do this. And I said, let's make a film, <laughs> you know? <laughs> and so I went out and I got a, a camera, a video camera and just started. And I thought, you know what? This is really amazing. Cause what happened is that I was visiting him, but there were also a few other volunteers actually who had brought in to visit him as well. One of whom was a young uh, kind of singer, it was very pretty. And another one was a, a guy named, um, his last name was Lewis, which was the same as Shane, Shane Lewis. And so, and there was someone else actually who visited him, um, who so each of them kind of fulfilled these wishes for him. Like Shane became his brother and he fell in love with, uh, you know, the young singer. And the other one brought this very famous director to visit him who flew in, who was, who'd always wanted to. And I was, so I thought it was like a really cool story. So I thought, why don't we make a story about like your lost days and how these people are influencing your life. And that's, became my first documentary called Visiting Shane. Sounds That's cool. how I got into it. <laughs> and obviously you then went on kind of, you know, making many more kind of successful documentaries. Well, I did. Well, that happened because I was also, meanwhile, making some scripted stuff. I did a scripted uh, web series and some short films, one called Window that did very well. Mm -hmm. And an executive producer, of the one the executive producer of the web series I did said, yeah, we should do a film. We should do like a feature together. Why don't you start sending me some scripts? Mm -hmm. So, but they have to be a certain genre. They have to be, you know, horror, comedy, you know, like what he deemed commercial. 
And so I thought, okay, I'm going to be able to find a really meaningful film that is of genre and then send it to him. And he kept saying, no, 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 this has got too much good stuff in it. We don't want all that, you know? And so I thought, God, you know, what if I could, what would my dream film be? And right at that time, I'd seen a choir performance at Santa Monica High School, which is, I live in Santa Monica. And it really moved me and I was really fascinated by it. And I was really fascinated by the choir director. And I was thinking, what if I made a film about Jeff Halls, you know, this choir director, and how does he get this extraordinary music out of these students? And that's was, you know, and then I just, I could just do that and I don't need anyone's permission and I don't need to wait for anything. Um, and so that's really, that's when I really launched, you know, fully committed into the documentary form. Mm. Well, you know, at SDI, we've been running a campaign called 50-50 campaign to uh, try to uh, help more women to, uh, to go into directing documentaries. Um, have you found your career as a woman? I mean, what, what kind of um, barriers have you found or not kind of, you know, being based in the States? Um, there is no doubt that I've experienced an extraordinary amount of, I don't know, I guess they are barriers. Um, you know, you see in the news all the different things that occur between the sexual advances, coming to hotel rooms and producers being naked with their robes, you know, being shoved and pushed aside, being mocked. I mean, I went through it all because I was a script supervisor. And I was very engaged and, you know, I've got this personality. I'm, I'm, I care, I guess you could say about the shot and what's in it. And I always formed very strong relationships with directors and it was very threatening. So I went through a lot of stuff. And also, I mean, I started as a production assistant, sweeping floors, getting them as clean as you could possibly get them. You know, like everything I did, I took a hundred percent plus because I knew I had to, and still I would see comrades who were males, you know, advancing. Mm -hmm. And I was still, you know, huffing and puffing, knowing even that uh, I, it was gender biased, it was no question. So I just would never, but I, dev, I, you know, at one point I just decided, you know what, these are the cards I've been dealt and this is the cards I have to play. How am I going to play those the best way possible? And one real, one you know, thing I realized was I've got to take you know, the power of my own hands and I'm going to have to do my own projects if I'm going to be moving forward. I can't be waiting on anyone or relying on anyone. So the documentary form is, is you know, very empowering in that way. Hmm. And how did you balance between being a filmmaker and being a parent? Um, well, I definitely made parenting my priority. And my husband would say to me, Varda, you know, why don't you get out there and like make, you know, direct? That's what you're really good at. That's what you should be doing. And I said, I will, I will. But right now I'm a mother, you know, and our children need us. And so basically the script supervising served me well in that regard. And I continued to make shorts and and I just kind of waited and observed. And I, when our children were young teens, that's when I started to get back into it more aggressively. And I've just been working ever since. So what I did was when I decided, when I, I went cold turkey and stopped script supervising completely, because I knew that I was kind of enabling me to kind of be in between. And at that point, and this is how crazy it, it is, and it wasn't even that long ago, I, said, I, I had this vision. I said, you know what? I'm going to have to pretend that I'm like a 23 or 24 year old man just graduated from college. How would he do it? And I'm going to do it that way, <laughs> you know? And so that's kind of how I did it. I just thought I, can't. I couldn't really, because the commercials I worked on were multi-million dollar commercials. I was on this very highest level of commercial making. And so I couldn't fall back on any of that because that was always, you know, I didn't have those kinds of funds. I had to just start from the grassroots and work my way back up again. Mm, fantastic. Well, that's a very good tip for women. So let's talk about kind of Fandango at the wall. Kind of, you know, how did this project come about? Um, well, it, it started, you know, about uh, two years into the Trump presidency. And at that time, I think everyone knows, I'm pretty sure you guys were exposed to this. 
that, you know, that administration was very anti-immigrants. Mm -hmm. I mean, it made it seem as though they were just against people coming across the border illegally. But I will tell you, I was in a cafe before the pandemic hit and someone was listening very loudly to a Trump speech and it said very clearly, like no cell phones. And so I said, oh, excuse me, sir. Do you mind turning the volume down? I didn't even ask him to stop. I just, just so that, you know, I could have my little tea and, you know, mm -hmm. be able to focus. And he said to me, go back to your country. That's what he said to me. <laughs> yeah, That's yeah. how bad it was. Go back to your country. So it really infiltrated everything. And, you know, in Santa Monica, we, and I'm very aware being, I've lived in Santa Monica, in San Francisco, we have San Diego, Santa Cruz. Me this used to be Mexico. Mm -hmm. And there's still a very strong Mexican presence here, which I love. And I feel very respectful of, and Mexico's our neighbor. It's like three, a three hour drive to Mexico from where I live. So when the vilification of Mexicans started to happen, it, it felt very personal. And my being an immigrant, and having lived on different continents, you know, to me, Nirvana is, you know, diversity is all different people coming together and enjoying each other's differences and celebrating them through culture. So I felt very like I had to do something about what was going on with the children being separated from the families. Now we have children at the border again. And, um, so the first thing I did was on 4th of July, we have a small parade here in Santa Monica. Mm -hmm. And I basically crashed the parade with these signs. I, I made pictures of families and children in cages and I walked the parade and people were like clapping and I mean, they, they wanted to do something, but then I thought, that's not enough. I said, maybe I should make a film about, you know, this and maybe at the border with music. And right at that time, Film Fatale, which is a women's directors group, mm -hmm. Iram, another uh, woman director, posted that she had a friend of a friend who was looking for someone to film a music festival at the border between the United States and Mexico. And I immediately jumped on it. And that was the, the root of this, this project. It became Fandango at the Wall. So that concert is not actually the concert that we see in the film. That was a different preempting no. the concert that you ended up with. Um, that was Fandango for Teresa. Okay. So it was, it was, the, it's, it's not really a concert. It's a community gathering of song and dance in the Sonorato tradition. There is a concert in the film and that is the closing concert in New York city. Mm -hmm. But Fandango for Teresa really is a community gathering of song and dance. Mm -hmm. And in this case, it takes place simultaneously on both sides of the border. So yes, it was that, because that was the original idea. They were originally just looking for someone to, to kind of shoot that. But once I got on the phone with Kabir, who's, you know, my comrade in arms here and a soulmate, um, we started to talk about this project and it, it very quickly became clear that it was something bigger. Mm -hmm. So the fact that uh, um, this kind of gathering kind of you know, was mainly based around Tirana, was that the perfect setting in terms of uh, um, rooting your, uh, this documentary? I think it was because I do believe that culture, that music, song, dance, you know, and I think other art forms are a great meeting place mm -hmm. for people. And people who have all different beliefs, all different ways of looking at the world can come together in these kind of safe havens. Mm -hmm. And um, so I do think it was, it is, it was the perfect, kind of heart to the film. Mm -hmm. And, you know, my idea was also, I wanted to tell an alternative narrative about Mexicans, about people south of the border or people that are othered. And I wanted to bring people up close and personal to be intimate with people, to come to their own understanding and their own view of these people that is, you know, more truthful and honest than, you know, this kind of hyper, vilification and othering of people that, you know, is, is really false. It's a false narrative. Yeah. I mean, you've got many characters kind of, you know, in, uh, in the film, 
which uh, all all of them are kind of you know wonderful but how did you actually start casting the people i mean who who came first kind of you know who led on kind of you know the journey um well that's a good question i'm still discovering because you know <laughs> I, I know I have my point of view and I'm still learning the point of view of all the other people involved, especially in a particular Arturo, who you see in the film, Jorge and Kabir. Um, it was really the four of us who, before post, Luis is listening here and Luis, that we, there's a whole post-production side we haven't even spoken about is this very instrumental to the making of the film and Dina made a post. Um, but that's a separate part. But this early phase is, Basically, I worked very close. The, Arturo was already involved. Arturo is the one who originally read the article about Fandango for Teresa and went to Kabir to say, I want, you know, I, I think there's something here. You know, what do you think? What if we took the orchestra to Fandango for Teresa and recorded an album there? Jorge, I mean, Arturo and Kabir knew really little about San Horacho, just like I didn't know very much about it. Mm -hmm. So there was some initial kind of exploration about the album. And then it was Kabir who came up the, with the idea we could make a film. So Kabir, I didn't know if Kabir was going to be in the film originally. Mm -hmm. um, so that was kind of a surprise, but it made sense for him to be in it. Arturo, of course, was going to be in the film and the orchestra. And there were guest artists, Raheem, Saba. Akua Dixon, the Villa Lobos brothers, um, Antonio Sanchez. So there were a lot of amazing artists, Mandy Gonzalez. So this, so the challenge was we had these incredibly kind of quite well known, some of them mm -hmm. artists. And then we discovered the, the you know, the Sonoracho aspect of it. And the, and the, the, the fact that these Sonoracho masters came from Veracruz to the border. And so it became, this discussion that in a way sometimes was a little bit heated around, well, gosh, we've got people who are recognized and known and we've got all these people who are totally not known. Yeah. Right. How do we, what is the story? But for me, it was very important. My intention, mm -hmm. which was to create this alternate narrative about these people who have been vilified. So to me, they were the story, <laughs> you know, and uh, it was, I mean, I, I admire and like deeply, would love to be able to make films about the other people. But so it decided it was that guiding light of the initial intention and vision that determined who were going to be the main characters. And that was the, the Sonoracha artist. And then in terms of who the Sonoracha artists were, Jorge already had an idea. He'd already, Patricio had come before, Fernando, Tato and Wendy um, had come. And he so he already knew that, you know, those were probably going to be the people. He also decided, he also wanted to have people who would be very open to collaboration. And because some of the Sonoracha artists are purists and they will not interact and collaborate with orchestras. You know, it's really, but these, these, these particular masters and they are masters were more open to collaboration, already had done some work that was kind of crossing over into different genres. So he thought they would be good. And then, you know, just from a storytelling perspective, I really wanted a couple um, as opposed to that's how Thatcher and Wendy happened. And then I also wanted a very strong female character because mm -hmm. as the list was coming to me, it was like all men. And so that's how, <laughs> that's how we came up with Marta. And mm -hmm. then it just turned out that Marta's father is, you know, Andres Vega, who's kind of the trunk, the core of San Horacho. So he kind of came along and that was sort of an unexpected bonus, really. Mm. Yeah, I mean, that negotiation between uh, famous and not so famous characters, um, but also in the context of, uh, um, you know, dealing with different culture, uh, that must have kind of required quite a little bit of building the trust between you as a director and them in, in their communities, their village. I mean not for you not to be perceived as someone stealing their music and taking it away to kind of, you know, to New York. Uh, surely, I mean, you must have had some interesting conversations as a director. Um, well, I will say one thing, number one, I think it was an advantage that I'm female in that regard. Interesting. Mm -hmm. Less threatening. Um, 
and you know I do come from a place of love and I have a very good intention and that always comes first for me and I think they sense that even though I was very hard you know like when you're making a film and you don't have much time you go in then you take care of business it's not like you know I can be tough but but the, the core intention is really coming from a good place and um, I think they could sense that and because Jorge is the one who made the introduction they really trust him mm -hmm. and they they were all you know very supportive of Fandango from Teresa so they were very open from the start I have to say although later I, I learned that they were kind of a little bit like astounded by how I just entered their homes you know just kind of went for it because we didn't have a lot of time but one thing I learned which is really interesting but I and, but the respect is always there and I I would never ever I feel very respectful of the subjects of my films mm -hmm. if if they if someone said I don't feel comfortable with that I don't want that in there because I really feel that it's a violation, I would take it out. Like, I'm not interested in any violations whatsoever of any human being, ever. Mm -hmm. You know, it might happen unintentionally, but I would never intentionally do that or want to do that. Um, but, but I am very kind of, I guess you could say, focused and forward moving when I'm in production. Mm -hmm. um, and an example of that was I, I did a short, well, I was, I was, hired to go to uh democratic republic of congo to shoot a, a a catholic mystic on tour and they had said to me that when we first land in the congo they wanted me to get a shot of her coming off the plane and the plane was and i'd never been to the democratic republic of congo before um the plane had been extremely delayed so we arrived at about three o'clock in the morning in the middle of the jungle and they were still sleeping but I'd ask the, the steward to to wake me up so I could get my slap my equipment I'll never forget this and so I was so determined to get the shot that the moment the plane landed and the, the door opened I literally ran out with my equipment and all that were there was like men wearing army uniforms with guns and, but I didn't even barely notice them. I mean, I remember their faces of shock as I flew by them. <laughs> Their shock. Who's this white female? <laughs> I know. But they let me go because I was just like so directed. I was just like, it was no stopping me. So that's kind of an example of when you have to get the shot, you do what you need to do to get the shot. But still being respectful. Well, Fandango is kind of beautifully shot talking of uh, visuals and I love the way you create an intimacy with especially the characters in in the, in the community um, and and the way I mean it would be so easy to just be taken over by the music but you succeeded in great getting the uh, the visuals to grab us and take us on this journey as well how did you kind of plan it how did you kind of i mean you, you had a very good dop i believe working with you also but how did yeah. you communicate with him etc well um i really wanted to i mean i love experimenting and of course there's always a risk when you experiment but there's also it's more you know it's fun and you you create you could create more beautiful things and unexpected things with experimentation. So I thought, you know, what if, how do I bring the audience? I really wanted to bring the audience along with us and have the audience feel like they're part of it, the viewer to feel like they're there and it really in it, you know, and really feeling it. And so I thought, I said to Matt, Matt, what if we, you know, if you use some kind of rig that gave you a lot of fluidity and when the music and that you kind of like almost, moved in the sound waves of the music mm. um, and you know and kind of used used the motion of the camera to kind of spring you know to sweep us in to get pulled into it and even with some of the interviews and conversations um, the same thing and so I remember that first shoot was with Ramon in his courtyard in Jalapa and 
some of it isn't in, didn't make it in the film. We did some really cool stuff that never made it in. But <laughs> that shot where he's performing in the courtyard and Minerva, who's the, the bailadora, the dancer, is um, you know dancing next to him on the tarima. And I said, okay, Matt, you know, let let's do it. Like when they sing, and when she dances, imagine the sound waves in your mind and ride them, mm. ride the waves. And he goes are we really going to be doing that? And I said, <laughs> I said, he goes, I mean, I've had other directors say things to me in the prep, but once we come to shoot, you just, you know, you do the safe thing. And I said, no, 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 we're really going to be doing this. And he loved it. I mean, it was, he just gave himself to it and he did such a fantastic job. And I wish in a way we had more behind the scenes footage because he was literally almost like dancing with them. It was really beautiful. And I would be kind of behind him and, you know, we might do a, few retakes or whatever but it was for the most part in as you see it is what it was mm. i mean that fluidity of movement is very attractive and uh, i know dops love doing it but then the editor comes back and say hell how do i cut this so how did you cut it um well you know i always did make sure to get wide shots we had multiple cameras. Sometimes I would shoot, sometimes our line producer would shoot. So I was always making sure also to capture the environment, um, to capture details and, you know, to have a nice wide, robust range of footage. Mm -hmm. So we, we always had outs here and there, but we also decided as much as possible to to create the illusion, at least, of, of real time, to use as much of that footage as possible. But not necessarily, I think Louisa did, and Louisa, who's here, was, is fantastic with editing music, with music. I mean, it's just like gifted, I would say, in that regard. And so she was able to, to use some of the, you know, to use the motion, but then somehow cut it. So we, we've, we have compacted it to a certain extent. Um, but yet create the illusion that it's continuous. But the other thing that we did, which I think is one of the reasons it works, the success of the film, is that originally I thought we were going to be scoring it and Arturo was going to do the score. But then we realized, oh, you know, we can keep, one of the ways we can keep the music going and not cut it short, which is I know a lot of people who watch music documentaries get disappointed because there's not enough music in there is that we just kind of let the music go at, almost as the score and continue under the, um, the interviews or under discussions and under other shots. Mm -hmm. So that way you kind of almost create the illusion that you're, you know, you're just full of music and the music is overflowing, but yet we're moving on at the same time. It, it really worked. I mean, for those kind of, you know, the music as a transition between different moments, but I also loved the way you transit from the music in the, in the community into the music, the concert in New York, the formal concert. I, I wouldn't think that it would work, but it, it really did. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, we, we found, you know, a lot, a lot of it is exploration and, you know, you try different things and somehow we found it and I think what I really love about that is I love that it kind of creates a sense of suspense and foreshadowing you you know we by the way there were other performances there we there was a bunch of incredible stuff in an auditorium in Tijuana when the Sonoraja artists rehearsed and performed you know, in rehearsal with the orchestra and so at a certain point we had all of it we had you know, the, the music's happening in the in the field, so to speak. Mm -hmm. Then we went to the auditorium where they were rehearsing when it wasn't quite as orchestrated, but it was a little bit more formal. And then it went to the orchestra, but then it, it became burdensome. It just felt like too much. Mm -hmm. It stopped having that fluidity. So we pulled all of that and we just went right into the orchestra, orchestral, you know, orchestrated stuff. And, you know, just, again, managed to find, I think, just the right balance of it. But it, it served to, also, it was a great, a, way, a great way of connecting, like a glue, because, you know, it's a challenge to interweave Fandango Fronteriso, Arturo and his orchestra and Kabir, the Sonorato artists, mm -hmm. and the New York performance. How do you 
get all those elements working together. And so this was a great way of like slowly weaving it in. So when we arrived at the mm -hmm. concert at the very, well, first of all, when we arrived at Fandango for Teresa, it didn't come out of nowhere. That's why we had that bookend. That's why you saw it in the beginning. So that yeah. you kind of knew you were going to come back to it. And this, and with the, that's kind of what the weaving it together with the orchestrated park does it. So when you arrive to the symphony space, it doesn't come out of nowhere. It just doesn't, you know, like, what's this? We're kind of prepared. We, we were kind of wondering where that was going to take us. Yeah, no, it feels really nicely interwoven as opposed to a final point, really. But at what stage of um, the production did you actually think of its structure? Um, well, it's a combination. I, I always had the set, I always knew we were going to weave the orchestra you know orchestra stuff together mm -hmm. from the beginning that was all, that was the original one of the original concepts and i knew we were going to visit the different sonoracha masters we were going to get to know something about arturo kabir was a total surprise but i think that worked really well and we're going to find out a little bit something about jorge the mm -hmm. road trip i did not know the way that that happened and it, i'm so grateful and this is a good lesson for everybody Obstacles are the greatest gift of all because that's where innovation happens. Um, so you got to embrace them and then you got to really like be with them instead of try and get around it. Go into the obstacle because in this case, we we didn't have so much time because these locations in Veracruz are very distant from each other and often require long drives on dirt roads and long drives from one location to another. So we, the challenge was how, and we were already there when this was happening or when we first arrived and I suddenly realized, oh my God, how am I going to get like conversations and interviews with Kabir, Arturo and Jorge when we're like on the road all the time, we're going to need all our time with this Sonoracha artist. And it happened during the night. I was up thinking about it and sleeping and kind of, you know, tossing and turning about it. And then it suddenly hit me. Why don't we have them talk in the car? Exactly. <laughs> right? Like they're going to be in that car all those hours. Why don't we just follow, you know, get it rigged up, be able to shoot them in the car, do a follow car, you know, with the recordist, and let's just do it there and make these conversations in the car where they're reflecting on things and talking about issues and this and that. And so that's how that happened. And then that started to go, oh, yeah, we're on a road trip. You know, and so that's how that evolved. So that part was a surprise. So how many people did you fit in that car? Five. <laughs> that's quite a squeeze by filmmaking standards. <laughs> but we were also following. It worked really well, actually. I could hear. I, we, we stayed in a van right behind them, and I could actually hear everything they were saying the whole time. <laughs> that's brilliant <laughs> yeah that was it was yeah that was actually a gift that was a gift from above mm. so tell us a, a little bit about the challenges of uh, working in that region i mean surely uh it well kind of traveling anyway with uh, you know while filmmaking is already a bit of a challenge but uh, uh, the region itself was it easy to go around with cameras? Was it, I mean, how did you go about it? Um, well, you know, I had the great fortune of having a marvelously, you know, cooperative and proactive crew. We all got along really well mm -hmm. and everyone was great. And um, Pedro Gonzalez Kuhn, who's the line producer, is Spanish, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and he had done another film called Fra Fragil Equilibrio, which was about global migration and was shot in several different countries. So that I loved and I kind of attracted him down and befriended him prior to all of this. But when this project came along, I was thinking, oh my gosh, I wonder if Pedro would be willing to come on board as a producer, a line producer on this, because he really, he's done this all over the world already. And he did he did luckily and he's incredibly good with logistics and he loves driving he he drove the van the whole time and of course he's bilingual and he was a little bit uh well i don't want to say but something else but anyway um so 
we just all went with the flow. The danger was that that area is very heavy with, uh, you know, cartels and drug violence. Yeah. And the first time we went, we had never been there before. And he had done some research and he was told it's very dangerous. So we got guards. Um, I have a photo. I wish I had it. We had three guards. We had two guards following us and one guard in the van with us. It was a female guard in the van. And she literally had her gun out the whole time with her hand on it. And if I wanted to stop and pop out and shoot something, by the way, this happened in the Congo too, where, you know, you see something and you, you say, stop. And we all jump out. She, you know, would jump out and they would kind of circle us. And, you know, so we felt safe and we, and we just moved through it. The second time around, I don't know, it's expensive to have guards. Yep. So we were thinking like, how can we get around this? And so we decided if we had some local, actually Jorge said, if you have some local people with you, you're okay. You know, cause the first time we went, we were alone. We actually, we had one woman with us who is a San Gerardo artist, really. I didn't realize that. And she kind of, you know, she'd never been in a film production. So she didn't quite understand the look, you know, she was more like on holiday with us, basically. It was pretty funny. She was supposed to be our PA, but uh, Melissa is her name. And you see her in the film a little bit playing her Harana. Um, but so the second time we did have some, you know, we had actually uh, Marta, Marta's brother was with us. And of course, Jorge was with us the second time. And so we felt a little bit safer because, you know, we weren't on our own. We had, or, you know, people who had been there many times before. And I mean, your characters are wonderful, you know, talking about the music, of course, and where it comes from. And, you know, I mean, basically the art kind of, you know, of San Gerardo. But just, I mean, your original idea was really to um, look at migration and the vilification of uh, migration. So how did you manage to turn them to kind of the tone into a more political tone. Um, yeah, that was that was a challenge for sure as well. I mean, the the the, the, the balancing act was ultimately we wanted to feel have the audience leave feeling hopeful and positive and and engaged. You know, feeling like there's like some wiggle room here. This is a huge global challenge for us. This is, I think, one of the most serious. You know, human we've got global warming but we also it, in, you know interact with human beings and violence and corruption all that stuff so global migration is i think one of our greatest challenges right now and but at the same time you know we really wanted to leave you feeling hopeful mm. and so but i didn't want to make like a fake you know like just a happy-go-lucky story because we have these horrible horrible things that are happening and so we just found waves. Luckily, the um, the music guided us to a certain degree. Patricio's song, Las Patronas, which is about the women who throw the food up on the beast, which is that big train that grows across Mexico, carrying the migrants. Mm -hmm. We were able to kind of use that. And then we have Fernando's poem in which he talks about these issues. So it was just a great kind of synchronicity, I guess you could say, between the artists and what they were talking about, what they cared about and what we wanted to say, what I wanted to say, it all, we all had the same interests and we all were serving the same purpose. So we were able to kind of leverage those elements. We left some things out. For example, we were in Tijuana when those migrants, they were what they called caravans coming to Mexico, trying to cross the border and we did go there at first with Pedro and I, and I know some cinematographers or shoot, you know, in Tijuana and sound people. Anyway, we, we put a team together while we were scouting in case we came across something we, should, we thought we should film. And in fact, something did happen. We went to the migrant camps and I interviewed a bunch of families and, you know, coming from different countries in South and Central America. And then when we went to the border, there was a big protest and they climbed up the, the barrier and actually went on top. And they had these big 
Trump posters and all sorts of stuff. I mean, it was really fascinating, but we decided not to go there because we want the film, anyone to be able to watch the film and gain deeper insight and understanding rather than get all riled up and go into opposition. So it was, a, it, was a, it's, it was about getting as much in there. Plus we didn't want it to be, we wanted it to be timeless and not rooted in this one situation because this, this, these challenges are universal and they are timeless. So it was just weaving in enough of it for it to get people thinking and feeling and considering the complexity of these issues, but at the same time, um, not, not react against it. Mm -hmm. Well, the poetry of the way they express themselves certainly kind of, you know, was retained throughout kind of, you know, the, the film. And I think that's really important to show that people have got political motivations, but nevertheless, they've got a, um, a poetical way of being able to express it to themselves and to the rest of the world. So that was really fantastic to, uh, as an audience, to be able to, uh, to receive that. And of course, the fact that it was subtitled, uh, what well, translated made a big difference to be able to engage with the verses kind of, you know, being expressed. Um, I, I think it allowed us as an audience to get closer to, to the ideas and not just kind of stay at the level of, uh, um, yeah, the vocals and, uh, uh, and, and the music. So, uh, so that was, you know, really, really good. Uh, but I'm sure having a subtitled film, I mean, I don't know what it's like in, uh, in the States, but in, uh, in the UK, it's, uh, it's really quite a challenge to, uh, to sell a project which relies on constant kind of subtitling. Um, what, what, uh, what was your experience on that? Um, I want to add one other thing to reflect on something you just said, and one thing that I try to do as much as possible in documentary filmmaking is to put myself aside as much as possible to give voice and kind of serve as a channel. And I'm sh I know it might sound weird, but as a channel for the, what the film is mm -hmm. rather than what my opinion or how I think it should be. Maybe I, I use my, self as a guide aesthetically and like whatever I know about the craft and filmmaking, I can use all of that. But in terms of my opinions on what is being said or how it should be said and all of that, I see the people in the film as being part of the makers of the film. It's not separate, mm -hmm. like how they see it, how they perceive what they think. It's my, I feel it's my job to serve as a way of optimizing expression of that, not so much my take on it, if you know what I'm saying. Yeah. I mean, you, you can't, you, you, you try to do that as much as possible. You know, you kind of come with some baggage that you just cannot shake. But, um, you know, so that's really important. So I believe everyone in the film, in a sense, is a maker of the film as much as I was a maker of the film and, and, and all my collaborators in Mexico. Mm -hmm and how they perceive things. I was very careful to try and listen as much as possible to their perception of some stuff that I thought maybe should stay in there and their reasons. In fact, I still sometimes think that, but I listened to them. <laughs> <laughs> I took it out, but I still think, God, oh, you know, I still like the things I wanted in there that they said I should take out, but I did take it out to, because I, I just believe in, there's gotta be something to it. Basically, if numerous people said like this feels like you're stereotyping people or whatever, then I mm -hmm. out it went um, or it like undermines what the bigger meaning is if it stays in there. Mm -hmm. So I, I, I listened to that and I, I actually took out stuff that I was very attached to because of that. So I just want to mm -hmm. express that in case someone else is doing a film in a different culture. It's very important to be really here and listen. Uh, and, and know that you do come with biases, even if you don't see them or believe you have them. They're there. It's, yeah. you can't, you know, it's in the, you brought up that way. So in regards to the subtitling, first, let me say we put a lot into the interpretation of these words. Um, it was done at Dina Mita Post and they, Fabiola, they had someone dedicated to it. She did her first go at it um, and that had to be redone because she was literally 
in the best with the best intentions interpreting the word not interpreting the words just I'm putting the literal words yeah you could, you could hardly even understand it it was english but you, you could hardly read it it was so <laughs> difficult i started crying when i first saw it because i didn't really i didn't quite understand why it was happening and i was like i can't understand this and i don't know why <laughs> this is so bad and I'm crying and then I realized oh now I get I, I realize it's because it's so little it's not being interpreted mm -hmm. it's not being shifted into how we use English language it's just literal the words so then they, she went back and we did it then once we had our that was of the footage I had to have all the footage subtitled because I'm not fluent in Spanish I understand some Spanish and I used to be fluent as a teenager but I lost a lot of it so then once we finished the film we circled back to the subtitles and she and i sat in a room and we literally went through every single word and she and i would discuss what the meaning is and what it you know and then once we were done our producer kabir did the exact same thing again and he and he analyzed every single apostrophe every single period i it was amazing how much went in and then we had jorge read it and make sure so there was a lot that went into those subtitles because that's all that the english speakers are going to get yeah don't speak spanish yeah. now in terms of the um the selling of it well this is the irony in the united states we have a huge spanish-speaking population or bilingual spanish english population mm -hmm. huge in fact so big that HBO has a channel dedicated just to that. And that particular population watches more video and watches more stuff than, you know, other groups. Mm -hmm. So there's a definite demand. And what happened with Fandango at the Wall is very shortly after we finished it, Kabir, who's produced a bunch of records and albums in the, in that, in the Latinx community, um, include, you know, jazz, and he kind of mixes it up because he's very interested in this cross-cultural thing, as is Arturo. And so he had a relationship with Sony Music and he showed it to someone high up in the Sony Music Latin um, group, Ruben. And he saw the film and he immediately wrote him back and said, this is what we, this is who we are. <laughs> and he said, when we go to these other countries and find these pop artists and go visit them, the first thing they do is take us to the folk artists and like the music of the country. Yeah. And that's what they really love. And that's kind of their roots. And we've always been wanting to somehow recognize that, but haven't found a way to do it that we think is commercial or that will, you know, get out there. And, and he said, and this film does that. So they immediately wanted it. It happened very fast. And then they have a very strong relationship with HBO and HBO had the same reaction. Mm. So it actually happened very quickly, um, luckily and unexpectedly. It, I would have loved for it to, I mean, my idea was they would completely cross over mm -hmm. and I think maybe it will one day. And we do have a lot of people who've watched it who are not from the Latin or Latinx community, but uh, that's probably our biggest audience to date. So any filmmakers in the UK working with um, Spanish uh, um, uh, language should go to HBO <laughs> and hopefully get a, a commission from them. So does that mean that uh, um, the film was very easy to, um, you know, for the budget to come together? You didn't have to worry about money? Um, well, No, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> I basically, I, I'm, you know, I, Kabir said to me, what will it take to do this? And so I sat down with Pedro actually, and we went through every single category. Luckily at that point, I had already met with Luis Carbolar. Luis Carbolar was our supervising editor. Mm -hmm. And he was the top at the top of my list for editors because I really wanted a bilingual editor. I wanted an editor, you know, ideally originally from Mexico. I wanted one in LA and, uh, and in all my research, you know, he kind of popped up at the top because I love his work. And so I reached out to him, actually to his agent who connected me with him. He and I got together 
at that point, we had already shot some of the footage, the way that we did it. And this is the way I'm going to do my next project. And it worked really, really well. And the way I did my prior project is that I got enough footage together, enough imagery together, enough of a concept and a take on the film together to create a teaser. Mm -hmm. And so the, the plan with Fandango at the wall was that I would get enough footage together to create a teaser with which then Kabir could go out and raise the additional funds. At that point, I had just budget, did the budget enough for the teaser. Okay. Mm -hmm. Once we had that and I created the teaser and it did involve going to Tijuana, it involved going to Veracruz, um, just the kind of part of, so it was part of the shoot as well, but it served to create the teaser. That I was able to show Luis. I think it was either that. Yeah. Yeah. I was able to show that to Luis. And so Luis got like that. And he did want to be a part of it. And that's when he said to me, um, well, I, you're never going to be able to afford me. So the only way. <laughs> Great introduction. Yeah. He goes, I want to do it, but you can't afford me. So why don't we do this? How about if you use my brother's production, post-production house in Mexico City? And I'll serve as a supervising editor. And they have really great editors there. And so you can kind of work with them and I'll always be part of the mix. I'm, I'm going to make sure that it comes out okay. You know, and I, I was so excited because I really wanted to do this cross-cultural collaboration behind the camera and in front of the camera. So it was exactly the kind of thing I wanted to do. And I spoke with Paolo, who's his brother and who owns Dinamita. And, that, and I was able to get a budget. So based on that for the post-production. So I had a solid budget you know, that I felt good about, that they felt good about for the post and then, you know, based on experience and stuff, knew what other money we needed, presented a budget to Kabir and then he kind of negotiated it down. And I just, you know, went with it because I, I, I just believed that I trusted him that we could come to some kind of agreement and then had a budget that he agreed upon and then I stuck to it. I never went a penny over. Wow, that's amazing because Budgets for editing are never enough uh, in my, um, yeah. <laughs> well, what we is we, well, what we did is we moved category, we moved stuff around. Mm -hmm. So it definitely had a cost to it. I lost some of the things that, you know, in marketing and PR and stuff like that. I had to pull from there. So it's, it's, I had to, I, there were, you know, and then it involved maybe, you know, some sweat equity on my part, putting, or, you know, in other people's parts too to a certain degree so some of us you know we kind of fell in love with the film and we just did what we had to to get it done but we had a we had everyone got paid and you know we had a good budget thanks to kabir and all his hard work raising the funds which took a lot and he did a really great job with it so how long did it take to edit the film um maybe louisa can help with that question i'm not good with time. Is Louisa still with us? I don't know if she yeah. is. Oh yeah, there she is. Can we let Louisa speak for of a second? Of course. She's yeah. The editor from in Mexico. Hi. <laughs> Hello. Hi, Hi. Louisa. Nice to meet you. <laughs> nice to meet you. Thank you. Well, it it was about ten months, I think. That's from not bad. from the, from the moment I started getting footage and watching footage mm -hmm. to having a locked cut, I think we it was like ten months. And you must have had a lot of footage. Yes, it was a lot. I, I think I spent maybe the first three or four months just going through the footage, and making notes, and uh, about four months of just uh, going through the footage. Yeah, and then about one or two months getting a like a first assembly. No, Varda, I think. <laughs> um, yes. Online, because I mean, Rosa, I'm assuming you stayed in Santa Monica and Luisa. Um, yeah. Well, it was a combination. Mm -hmm. By the way, so it's not to make people feel beat themselves up. We were lucky that Dina Mita and Luisa, you know, came up with a strategy that she worked with some other assistant editors and 
editors who were able to work on different things simultaneously. So that's how it could happen so fast. Yeah. We talk about that a little bit, Louisa, but by the way, I was in, in Santa Monica for the, a portion of it. And then I got on a plane and went to Mexico city for <laughs> three hours away. <laughs> yeah. It was very hard to do it that way. It was, I, there was no way I had to be there. And, it, and the moment I arrived and Louisa and I started working together, it was like amazing. It was like a complete transformation. Yeah, the first part of working remotely was a bit difficult before we got together. Yeah. Um, yes, we had um, we had several assistants. Fabiola, who did the the eventually the uh, the translation, she was also the edit assistant, mm -hmm. and we had a, a like a kind of junior editor. Uh, who actually became like an additional editor because she did, she really uh, did, a, uh, she worked a lot on it. But so I, so Luis was like the supervising editor, but in Dinamita, I was supervising. And so I was kind <laughs> of giving um, different uh, jobs to do to, to, to the people who were uh, kind of working with me. Mm -hmm. I would say, look, I want you to do exactly this. Just give me like a first uh, assembly of, of this, of let's say uh, Ramon's interview. But I had already watched all the footage and I already, I already had notes. So I would say, I want this and this and this and give me a selection of this and this and this. So I could continue working on another thing while that person was kind of, uh, doing a maybe first assembly of that part under my uh, my uh, instructions and then I could get that and it it it, had, it was already one step ahead let's say mm -hmm. so that's a bit how we worked and we, how we were able to work uh, faster mm. And editing music, I mean, you've got to be very specific really you can't just kind of cut any odd place um, do you have a, a musical background, Luisa? I do. I do. I, I actually, my my grandfather was a, a, a composer and big band leader mm -hmm. in Mexico. Uh, one one of the most important big bands in like the fifties. So I uh, I do. I and my grandmother was also in the music business, but she was a manager for uh, musicians. So I kind of grew up. Uh, listening to music and I have to say, uh, just like Varda, the moment I heard about this project, I said, <laughs> I'm doing that. I'm doing, I want to, I want to be there because I was very interested in, in, in doing a musical uh, documentary and I love music and I work well with music. Mm -hmm. I, but I feel it's, it's, if you have it, if, if you feel the music, I mean, I think editing and music, Mm -hmm. are very intuitive so very for creative. me that's for me that's how I, I i worked with the music in a very uh, intuitive way mm -hmm. i mean most directors tend to work with the same editors because after a few films it becomes like an unspoken language how you you create a film but here it was a very new relationship and not even a close one because we are not even physically in the same room. How did you negotiate your um, your different versions? Well, I mean, and I'll let Lucy talk a little. We had a lot of good cries together in the beginning, didn't we? <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes, we did. It, yeah, it, it was it like you say it wasn't easy really the first part of working remotely it wasn't easy getting to the same place but mm -hmm. i think once we got there uh, yeah it just it just flowed i mean it did we we i mean we both were determined to make it work and mm -hmm. and like luisa has said in the past like the, in that first section where it was really bumpy and a lot of it had to do with the fact that it was long distance and we hadn't have we met at all? Because I remember I came to visit um, Dina Mita. You, we, we met, we, we had a conversation first remotely, just to get to know each other before starting work. And then you came, because when we started, when I came in to start working on the film, they were still shooting. 
So you That's this right. was so you came to Mexico for the for the second when you when you went to Veracruz or on your way I don't know if into Mexico. Or out. Yeah, you brought the footage back, and that's when we actually had a sit down, and we we kind of watched through things and had a chat about that, right? Yeah. Yes, and I think that even though in the beginning part it was pretty tough, I had a very strong vision, and I, you know, there was just some. I, who knows what exactly was the root of it? But as Luisa says, that's kind of what led us to, to it. So in a way, maybe it was just had to be that way in terms of this film. We had to go through that part of it and stay together and work through it. Once we, that really bonded us because we'd been through, you know, ring, the ringer basically and came back out and we were still together and we we're still in it. So at that point we knew nothing could stop us and nothing could pull us apart. We were like, and then we did, we just, but once we were, once I was with her, we were synced up. I mean, we worked, it was really a beautiful and wonderful experience. And you've got quite a, a long list of um, exec producers and producers, and most of them men, I've got to say. How did you work with them, uh, especially at the stage of editing? Well, I, you know, at one point I said, Kabir again was, you know, the, the, my closest collaborator on the producing side. Once we finished shooting, you know, Pedro um, was instrumental during the shoot, but he stepped out after that. And there's another line producer, Toby Loomis, who came in and kind of handled logistics. But Kabir was really the one who I worked most closely with and I continue to. And I remember he was very empowering. He never, I, he made me feel the opposite. Like he, he, he pushed me up even further as a leader. You know, I would say something that where I was questioning uncertainty because you're the leader, you tell me, you know? And at one point he said, I, I went to him at the end and I said, Kabir, I just want to recognize that there was not a single moment in the shoot where I felt at all that you expected less of me because I was female. And I never felt ever that you disrespected me or I didn't feel anything around that at all, you know? And so I want to, I want to express my appreciation to you for that. And he just said, you know, he goes, maybe it's generational because he's in his early thirties. Um, he said, maybe it's generational. I don't know, but you know, I, I always saw you as the leader and you are, you know, you're the, the expert in this and you are the director and you know, I've always respected that. So, I felt that way with everybody. Mm -hmm. I never felt, you're right. It's a lot of, there are a lot of men involved in this production. Um, and- A lot of producers and having a dual role because I mean, like Kabir being in the film, a musician as well as um, a producer. That's a lot of things to negotiate around one person. Yeah, I mean, he just, he really, raised the bar for me, if anything. I mean, he was, he just, I never, again, I, I felt he was very empowering, if anything. I mean, I'm not saying it was always easy and we locked, you know, heads once in a while because I had an idea or whatever, but it was just like Luisa, that's normal. We, we stayed with it, we kept working it through and we came to an understanding of what is closer. And then, you know, another challenge would come and we, we just stayed with it, we talked through it, you know, and then we just kept going. So that's, how you create strong bonded relationships is that when you do have these uh you know misunderstandings or different viewpoints you see that there's something bigger that holds it and that is this mutual understanding and this mutual shared purpose mm -hmm. so so these conflicts happen within something much larger that contains it so we can keep moving forward yeah well, I've got um, a few more questions to uh, to ask you, Varda, but I really want to, um, our audience to be able to come in and start uh, um, typing their questions or raising their hand if they want to speak to you directly. Most welcome. Um, Alex is going to be monitoring it. Um, so have, have we got any questions to start with, Alex? Uh, yes, we have a question from Rohan who is asking, 
Um, how much time you had to set up for the shooting of the actual festival performances? Um, hmm. Well, I had it, we had enough time to strategize ahead of time what we would need. Uh, you know, maybe not much, you know, maybe a, a few days, I guess you could say, probably, where, you know, I knew that it was going on simultaneously on both sides of the border. So I knew that we needed at least a camera unit on the American side. And I also knew that we weren't allowed to shoot. So I knew it was going to have to be, you know, hidden or kind of stealth. Um, then I also knew we were going to have a lot of musicians and a lot of characters on the Tijuana side. So I knew we had to have multiple camera units and sound crews. But it all had to happen very quickly because I only found out about the project um, maybe three or four weeks before we started shooting. Um, so it all had to happen very, very quickly. And even the shooting of Fandango, Fronteriza, the way we planned it is our first trip to Veracruz, because again, there was some economics to consider. So our first trip to Veracruz brought us back to Tijuana, which was maybe a day prior to the arrival of Arturo Kabir and the orchestra, and maybe two days before Fandango for Teresa. So it was all very, very tight. And by the way, that was the first time I met them. I had not even met Kabir in person. I'd only had a couple of conversations with him on the phone at that point. So it's it was all very, you have to be, and I was, you no, know, remember, I, I do want to mention, this is called a master class, but I, I always aspire to have beginner's mind and to come from a place of not knowing. And the advantage there is it, you don't have all these presupposed ideas of how it should be. And you're just very present for the way it is. And you work with what comes at you and that's all, you know, and that's, you make it work. The moment you start thinking, Oh, we should be doing it this way or it should happen this way. All these doors start closing and you have a more narrow workspace. Mm -hmm. If you're open to believing that it's happening as it's meant to be happening, suddenly you can really move and you can really, you know, you have space to move. You have the creativity because it's, it's, it's all there for the taking. So I think that's a very important um, kind of, I guess, thing I've learned that I want to share with everybody in case it's helpful. Mm. I think following uh, Ruan's kind of you know, question, um, I wanted to ask about uh, um, well, the release of the film and uh, uh, the screening to both sides of the border. But, you know, how did kind of people react to the film? I mean, did you actually do any outreach work with it? Um, yes, I mean, we have done well over 30 panels and discussions in all different communities and continue to. The, so, so far it's only been released in the United States. Um, and we're just, you know, we're doing our very best to have discussions about the film, you know, to get the word out. Um, we did, a, you know, HBO helped a little bit in the beginning, mm -hmm. but then sort of stepped back. So it's, you know, we're the ones doing it and then it will soon be released in Mexico mm -hmm. in the summer, actually. So that's still the final kind of, nothing's been signed yet, but it will be soon. And in July, it'll start going to Mexico. And then I'm hoping Jorge will take the lead in terms of, you know, getting it seen and having discussions. And I'm hoping the Sonoracha artists will participate and get themselves, you know, out there more known. Um, we have, there's been some, it's a big Sonoracha festival that takes place in Veracruz and we provided a screener for that. And I came, you know, attended a virtual panel for that and, you know, it'll be ongoing. And then the next thing of course will be um, South America and Europe and Asia. So we'll, we'll, we'll make sure the film gets out, you know, across the globe. I mean, it's hard not to compare it to Buena Vista social club, which, uh, 
had such an amazing international success and and goes on. I mean, it's you know it's part of the legacy of uh, musical documentary, and I can see your film Valda being part of uh, of that club. I mean, uh, surely it's going to be like Snowball, you know. Slow, I mean, of course, the COVID period hasn't been the best in order for your musicians to travel, in order to kind of, you know, to have the same promotion, I guess, that normally a musical documentary has. You're right. And, um, you know, once again, I had to adopt that philosophy. I mean, that hurt, but I, I, know, I know I'm not alone and there's a lot of films. Um, some of them actually film, like big films haven't even been released. They just held them back. Mm -hmm. But we, we had to release this film um, in the timing we thought was important. But, you know, again, it's kind of, these are the cards you're dealt. We, our film came out during a pandemic <laughs> and we couldn't have, go to the festivals. We couldn't do this concert, like all these things that we'd wanted to do. This dream of, you know, filling a theater and we had the 5.1, you know, sound mix and seeing the audience get swept up in it. And, you know, I mean, that was the whole vision. Um, and I know that that's, I know what it feels like because we did all our color correcting in the theater. And even with that sound, you just get so pulled into it when it's big like that. Mm -hmm. But, you know, these are the ways that we, maybe we'll be able to do re-release of it in the theater, I don't know. But right now, I feel like we've done the best we can under the circumstances, you know? And by the way, when I said 30 or so panels, I didn't include film festivals, which, you know, I think we were in at least a dozen or 15 film festivals um, as well. So all virtual. <laughs> and yet there's something so physical and sensual kind of, you know, in, uh, in, in some of, kind of you know, the music. I mean, like, you know, so um, the patiada, so, um, the dancing that the women do. Um, that's just so sensual and it's so delicate. Um, it must have been a real pleasure, Louisa, to edit that. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> it, it was. It was. Oh, yeah. I mean, that's the one thing that footage was so nurturing. I mean, it was just such a joy to look at the imagery mm -hmm. and, and the people and, you know, who are in the film are just such beautiful human beings, you know, and have so much to give and are so warm-hearted and real and you know so we were very fortunate to have these incredible people you know participate in the in the film i mean of course now the political landscape fortunately uh, in the state is different from when you started kind of you know making the film um what role do you think your film is going to have into talking about that uh, that border well i think as I said, you know, earlier, the issue of people fleeing, you know, as refugees, whether it be discrimination, whether it be, you know, domestic violence or violence within the country, whether it be, you know, religious persecution, poverty, there is a lot of that happening all over the globe. And the countries that they're trying to get to are confused, uncertain, and have no clear policies around how to manage this. Mm. I mean, I think the way I see it, and this is my opinion, and it doesn't represent anyone in involved with the film except for me, but I think we need to have some kind of a global committee or something come together and figure this out because it's not going away. Mm. And I think it has to do, it has to be a cooperative thing. And it has to do some combination of assisting with these, some of these countries in a way that's not invasive or, you know, but sorting some of this out. And it has to be some kind of arrangement where when needed, some people can go to this country, some people can go to this country. It's gotta be figured out like right now, people are just being warehoused in refugee camps, essentially. Mm. That's how it's being handled for the most part, with a few people making it in. And that's just not, it can't go on like this. It's, it's inhumane. So I think it's an, this is going to be an ongoing issue for a long time. And I'm hoping that it will get people thinking about it from a kind of more compassionate way, and also believing that we can find a solution. Mm. 
Yeah. Um, Alex, I think we've got more questions. Um, we have a question from Kayesh asking your advice for festival submissions, especially for um, documentary films. Yeah. Well, I would say get to know people, like literally email the festival programmer, email the festival director, let them know you've submitted the film. Maybe find other filmmakers who've had films in there and ask them what their experience is and if they can connect you with some of these people. Get your film called attention to. Um, don't be shy about it. If you want to get the film into the festival, because it's very competitive, you really want to get to know the people, and make it very personal, as opposed to a, uh, you know, just this cold submission without anything else. I, then once you're in the festival, you want to connect with people and you know make the most of it and then once you've finished your run in the festival or while you're in the festival even you want to build your audience don't rely on the festival to have an audience you've got to reach out to people let them know it's happening ask them to attend ask them to tell other people about it then you also want to promote it you want to get it on social media as many places as possible maybe reach out to some press so in other words it's an engaged, it's not like dropping something and walking away. It in itself is a project. You really need to make the most of it. I learned this through the years because originally I thought, oh, I'll just submit the film to the festival and a lot of people will come and, you know, the festival will do this, the festival will do that. No, they, they don't do that. I mean, sometimes they do, but it's really up to you as the filmmaker to make the most of it. Just, you know, 100% and 360 degrees. Great. We're coming to the end in terms of um, questions. Anyone else would like to make a comment or? So, um, Vanda, it seems that, uh, um, you know, you, you're really enjoying um, as a director working with documentaries linked kind of you know, to music and voices and, uh, uh, and culture. What, what next for you? I mean, what, uh, where are you moving on? <laughs> um, well, I'll answer that question. I just wanted to share a few other insights I have about documentary filmmaking that I think might be helpful, if I may. Please. I think when making a film, not just a documentary, but a documentary as well, it's important to consider that all the elements you have on hand are part of the story you're telling. So the structure, the color, the sound, the layers of sounds, the music, the framing, the camera movements, um, you know, your, your choices of who the subjects are, the editing, the shots, there's so many elements to it. And I think it's really, the greatest works I think are the ones that where all those elements have been considered and aligned and come together to tell the story. And it takes a while to come to that. Once you experience that, then you, you realize, oh my gosh, there's just so much power in that. So I, I would suggest to the filmmakers, um, you know, the emerging filmmakers who are listening to consider that, that each element, there's power in every single element in the color does so much, you know? And so think about when, so when you're thinking about your how to put your film together consider how best to tell it is it with camera movement or it should it they be static shots should it be handheld should it be on a rig and a, you know more fluid on a ronin should they be fast cuts should it be aggressive should it be quiet let it sit let it be there's so many different ways of doing it and if you have a clear intention of what the film is and then align all those different elements to that intention then you're going forward you know you're going to create a work of art so the other piece of advice i would like to share is not sometimes you can get caught up especially when you're first starting you can get caught up with i want to be a filmmaker you know i want to make a documentary right <laughs> And then it all becomes about that. It reminds me of when I had my first baby. Um, 
we got so caught up with the birth. Like we read about how to give birth and we did the Bradley method. I gave my, I had my second baby at home, but it was, so then, but the first one, it was like, then when the baby was born, so it became all about the birthing process. And we forgot that at the end, we were going to have a baby. <laughs> it was like, how do you change the diaper? What do you do with the baby? Right? So it was such a shock um, the first time. So in this, with a film, think about why you are doing it. Why are you choosing this particular subject? It's that's the part. That's the part that's going to, make everything else meaningful after it. What is the story you're telling? Why this story? Why are you telling this story? And if you're really eager to do it, but you, you haven't, you, you're not sure, or, you know, wait, the story will come. It will come to you. If you're open to it and you know you really want to tell a really meaningful, juicy story that means something to you, you know, you start looking around, you start listening, and that will come to you. So don't jump the gun and just, you know, decide, oh, I really want to make a documentary. Oh, you know, I really love that tree out there. Maybe that will work that way, but it's, it's a bit risky. I think let it sit with you and then see what pulls you or see what arrives at your doorstep and then go for it. I mean, you talked before about that instinct, which kind of somehow carries you during kind of, you know, the filming. How much, I mean, how do you actually... Um, uh nourish kind of you know that that instinct how do you kind of listen to it um well i i love to hike um and i love to push myself physically meditate listen to music read i'm reading a lot more because i think that's very nurturing eat well get some good sleep when you can and listen to music, you know, all those different things that nourish you. When you can do those things, I would advise that. And I think meditation is super helpful, actually, to tell you the truth. And a lot of my insights have arrived, you know, either through meditation or I've, you know, been involved in a, in a Zen practice meditation off and on for many years. And I, a lot of what has come to me during these meditation sessions, I apply to my filmmaking. Mm. And so I, if when things get tough or difficult, you know, I do my best to return to awareness and just see what's there, you know, and just be with it and kind of know that, like I say, my overriding uh, philosophy is there's always a solution out there to be found, which is not to say that sometimes I don't, you know, just throw up my arms and throw myself on the bed and have a good cry. <laughs> but sometimes you need that too, you know. I think you just, I think the most important thing is before you go into the film, you really understand why you are making this film and telling this story and you've got your intention and that is your compass. You just bring it back to that. You know, why am I telling this story? What do I want? How, you know what the other thing I do? Actually, before the, I even start, I try and get the feeling of it. Mm -hmm. What is it? What, how do I want it to feel? How do I want the audience to feel watching this film? And then I, and I really sit with that a lot. And that's the feeling. That feeling is, is also a guiding light. I mean, this film definitely feels like it, it could, it should have been really great fun making it because you are with such amazing people and it's so positive and life affirming. I mean, all the stories that kind of they're telling, kind of, you know, but that doesn't take away that there's still kind of anxiety. There's still a need to look after yourself and look after your, your crew during the making of the film. Yes. I mean, think when you, take a moment and think about the Sonorato masters who've given of themselves so openly and so generously, Jorge, Arturo Kabir, the orchestra, all the investors who have put money into it, that they've made with their life force, the crew, so many people have put so much into it. And you really, at least I do, I really want them, I want to give back. And the way that I can give back is to create a really meaningful, beautiful film. Mm. And, and I, so they, they all feel like, oh, I'm glad I did that. I'm glad, you know, that was worth it. 
and usually it's in the edit you hit a point where you're not sure mm. that you've done it <laughs> and it's scary and that's the hardest moment when you go out you just don't know if it's going to come together and it just gets really 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 scary at that moment so no matter how and it, you're right it, it has been an extremely positive experience i loved it and i just i feel so grateful and to have been part of this experience and to be part of this film but however good it is you know filmmaking is challenging it's a challenging form and you're definitely going to go through some some tough times um but you know just move right through them and keep going and then you know it's just a memory afterwards well thank you Varda, for reminding us what a privilege it is to be a filmmaker people sharing their stories and their souls kind of you know with us um, and that's what guides us in many ways as filmmakers so I guess um, this is going to be kind of you know goodbye unless uh, Alex have we got um, any other comments or um... uh, no just a really no. um, sh a comment from Rohan just thanking uh, you Varda uh, <laughs> as well and Noah for the conversation so thank you so much well, thank you very much, Varda, and thank you, Louisa, for coming on board. It's lovely kind of also meeting so, uh, the kind of magical hands kind of you know, behind uh, the computer. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you, Noe. I appreciate it. I appreciate your questions and, you know, engaging with you and having this conversation. I really appreciate everybody who attended and is listening. And Alexandra, thank you also for putting all this together and it's, it's a real privilege and honor to be part of this so thank you and take care until we see you in scotland <laughs> yes definitely <laughs> thank bye. you bye, bye. <laughs>